Recording chapter two, C, uh, the third part of chapter two of Swift Rivers by Cornelia Meigs. Chapter two is called Forest Treasure. As he traveled back toward the cabin on the hill, his mind was more absorbed than ever in the new plan of cutting logs, since now he knew what a wealth of timber grew all about them. Although he had talked vaguely to Grandfather about the great project, he had still said nothing very defi definite as to his steadily growing plans. He felt sure, as he reflected upon the matter, marching steadily the while through the silent forest, that he must come to the subject carefully, since anyone so old as Alexis Stahlberg could not be plunged hurriedly into the idea of so great an undertaking. Chris might have to coax and persuade a little, but he was sure in the end that Grandfather would approve. The boy was somewhat puzzled as he came hurrying homeward up the last slope to hear the sound of an axe ringing and echoing among the trees. Had Grandfather found need to cut firewood so soon? Chris burst impatiently into the clearing which surrounded the cabin and then stood still in bewildered astonishment. Grandfather, stripped to his homespun shirt, was standing at the brow of the hill above the stream, swinging an axe with the same easy rhythm with which he could so he could also wield a scythe. The sound of the regular blows seemed to come back from every direction, as the noise of the wood chopping does reverberate in dense forest land. Every tree stem seemed to send back its small portion of the echoed sound, as though in powerless protest against the sharp onslaught of the axe. It could not, surely it could not be, that the rain of blows was falling on the trunk of the great walnut at the brow of the hill. Upon Chris Dahlberg's desperate exclamation, Grandfather turned about. He wiped his forehead, hot from effort, even in the cold, as he spoke. I have thought much of that plan which sprang up in both of our minds that evening. We talked of the restless lad who had wandered this way looking for gold and of what he said so truly about the value of logs. From what I have seen in my wanderings, I am certain that there is more than one master builder of good vessels whose heart would warm at the sight of the walnut and oak, the birch and pine which clothe these hills of ours. But why, why begin with this? Chris could scarcely voice his wonder at what his grandfather was doing, and he added a further misgiving. If we carry timber to market at all, it must go down the riverbed. And is not true? Is it not true that walnut logs are too heavy to float? I have thought of that also, Grandfather returned. In the older countries, I have seen them float logs of hardwood by pinning them between trunks of something lighter. Two stout spruce stems on each side of these walnut logs will carry them easily. There might be a better way to getting them to market, but I do not know it. Alexis Stahlberg stepped back and looked up at the towering height of the big trunk. Trees grow old as men do he declared slowly, and this great fellow will become no greater. There is nothing before him now but, in a few years more, the beginning of decay. It is my belief, boy, that there are great things for you to come out of this forest, and that it is for a single good purpose that this giant has been growing so long. I may be wrong, but it is my wish to see before I die that golden fruit was really hanging upon these branches for you, and that your road to fortune sets out from the foot of the little nut tree." Through the remaining hour of daylight, they worked together, blow by blow, each swinging the axe in his turn, but were only halfway through the great trunk by the time darkness fell. They talked by the fire that night and went over and over every aspect of their plan. Grandfather and his long wanderings had picked up much shrewd information and had seen, amid a multitude of other things, how the wise foresters in Europe cut timber from their woods without destroying them entirely. Eric Knudsen will help us, Chris suggested for it was plain that these two could not carry out so large an undertaking as the enterprise was growing to be. Later, he can bring his horse to drag the logs over the snow. Grandfather went to bed that night earlier than his usual custom, and Chris followed him with great willingness. The boy had not counted on sleeping late, however, and set up with a start to find the sun an hour high and Alexis Dahlberg no longer in the cabin. A strange cracking sound had wakened him. So unusual a noise that for a moment he could not identify it. It came again as he sat listening and was followed by a terrific splintering crash. In spite of himself, Chris covered his ears with his hands and sat motionless, refusing to let himself think of what had happened outside. Grandfather was right. Even trees grow old and fall into dangerous decay. 
If the wood of the walnut tree were ever to be of use, it was wise to cut it now. But how he shrank from the thought of seeing that magnificent thing brought to the ground at last. The door was flung open by open, and Alexis Dahlberg came striding in. Chris was used to thinking of him as an old man with slightly shriveled skin, with a trifle of uncertainty in his eyesight and walk. But for this moment, he was once more young Alexis Dahlberg, hero of a thousand strange adventures on land and sea. There was a flash in his blue eyes and a swing in his step which made Chris see him suddenly as he had been two score years ago, with all his strength leaping within him and with all the chances of a lifetime of adventuring still at his feet. He stood for an instant looking at the boy and then all of a sudden seemed to droop and grow old again. Oh, Chris, have I done right? He questioned almost pitifully. You have, Chris assured him, with all the force of young and bold confidence. In his heart, he knew that he would never have been courageous enough to cut the old walnut tree, but, it that, but that it was the proper thing to do nonetheless. The two ate their breakfast slowly and forbore to look out the window. It was only when the last of the household tasks were finished that they went slowly together out of doors. It was then that Chris took command. Now it is down. We must cut it into lengths, he declared. Cheerfulness came back with the music of the great singing saw, which they drew back and forth between them. They had launched their venture, and henceforth they would not look back. It was not until many days later that the great tree was finally reduced to a vast pile of logs with smooth brown ends as beautifully patterned as a web of tapestry. The winter closed down with steady cold and with only intermittent bursts of temp tempestuous weather. It was astonishing how much persistent industry could accomplish, for the piles of logs grew and grew under the untiring efforts of the three axemen. Grandfather made up in almost uncanny skill what he lacked in strength. Chris had somewhat less than a man's full power, but he had gained ample knowledge of just how to make the most of what he had. And as for broad-shouldered, broad-faced Eric Knudsen, he was an all-engulfing torrent of energy. Alexis Dahlberg used to say that the trees fell before his axe just as the tall, wild hay would drop before the swing of a lesser man's scythe. As the ground froze hard as granite, and as the heaps of logs grew great, the three began rolling them down the slopes to the waterside. Those too far away for rolling were dragged by Knudsen's horse to the edge of the stream. This year the cold works for us, and not against us, Alexis Dahlberg declared with a chuckle, as though he enjoyed the idea of outwitting these forces of nature, which at certain times had threatened to overpower him. Each timber had been marked at the small end with an iron stamp forged for them by Caspar Goddard. Grandfather had designed the shape of it, the rude outline, outline of a spreading tree. The weeks grew into months. The snow deepened and grew less. The twilight shortened and then grew longer. The turn of the year was past and the spring was coming. It was a day in late March with the sun beginning to show promise of melting the snow and ice at last that a most unfamiliar visitor presented himself at the door of the cabin. Chris, coming out with his axe on his shoulder, started back in astonishment on meeting none other than Uncle Nels upon the doorstone. The boy had grown hard and spare during the months of uninterrupted toil, but there was a clear light in his eyes and an ease and confidence in his bearing which had never been there during his years of unloved dwelling in the house of Nels Anderson. The older man looked him over with a coldly measuring eye and came to the subject of his errand at once. We will have much work on the farm this season and I have not such good helpers as I should like. I will take you back and say no more of how you argue, angered me. I, I will even pay you wages now. It was Chris Dahlberg's first impulse to throw back his head and laugh long and without restraint. Uncle Nels was offering as a favor to take him back into a slavery whose conclusion had been the beginning of a real living for him. But life in the silence of the woods and with such a man as Alexis Dahlberg had increased his courtesy so that he suppressed his laughter in time and replied seriously. I've come to understand that grandfather must no longer live here alone. I am not to be hired for I have other work to do. Nels Anderson drew back from the door as though his burst of anger needed extra space or it would strangle him. Other work? Yes, he sneered, the work that can be done by a clumsy boy who was never worth the bread he ate and an old man who has spent his years just as a fool spends a handful of jingling pennies. I have heard of your fine schemes and how you are cutting trees on the hillsides a thousand miles from where they can be of any use. 
Your grandfather's always spinning his old man tales of trolls and kobolds. He, he must have got you to believe that this is they who are going to carry your timber over the mountains for you. Alexis Dahlberg had been sitting very quietly on the bench by the fire, listening alertly to the talk between Chris and his uncle, but taking no part in it, leaving the boy to come, on his own, come to his own conclusion. Now, however, he spoke up in a certain hard, clear voice with a touch of mockery in it, a tone which he used only when he spoke to just such people as Nels Anderson. So wise a man as you should know when words are being wasted, Nels. I bid you come in and partake of our hospitality and wish us well in our venture. For what? For that would be more worth your while. Nels shot the old man a coldly venomous look, but said nothing in direct reply. He looked down the hill at the piles of logs laid all along the riverbed, waiting for the rising spring waters. He spoke low, slowly. If it is your plan to float that timber down the stream, remember, if you will, that I own land on both sides of the bank and past my place, they shall not go. By what right do you say that? cried Alexis Stahlberg, rising quickly and hobbling to the door, startled out of his appearance of calm. For answer, Nels only laughed aloud as he turned about and walked down the hill. All that evening, the old man sat mournfully beside the fire, shaking his head in misgiving over the threat of unexpected difficulty. Think no more of it, grandfather, Chris urged finally. The logs will not move for some weeks still, and when trouble arises with my uncle, we will find some way to meet it. Grandfather brightened, though with evident effort, and at least said no more of his forebodings. It was earlier in April than anyone could have dared to hope that the spring floods came at last. Chris could scarcely sleep for listening to the sound of running water and could not believe his ears when, above the blowing of a warm spring wind, he finally heard the patter of melting snow dripping from roofs and branches. The ice on which the greater part of the wood was piled grew black and rotten. At the head of the ranks of neatly stacked timber was the pyramid of huge logs cut from the walnut tree, each one pinned by long wooden pegs between a pair of thick spruce trunks. There was some other walnut also, a certain proportion of spruce and a world of clean, sweet-smelling white pine, all waiting for the great moment when the water should touch the first heap. Eric Knudsen and Chris were to travel with the logs, following them on their long journey down to the big Mississippi River where the rafts were made up and the timber started fairly on the high road to waiting markets. The two were ready days beforehand, waiting impatiently to be gone. Anna Knudsen had a young brother coming from the old country that spring. He and she and grandfather were to live together on the Knudsen farm. Since the journey might take a long time, Alexis Dahlberg had admitted reluctantly at last that he could not dwell alone. It was on one of the evenings when they sat waiting and listening that grandfather spoke of Stuart Hale. A strange fellow, he commented, looking reflectively into the fire. He's the best possible company for a long, lonely evening, but he's also a lad who, unless he changes his way of life, will never accomplish anything. A man may look for gold half his years and fail to see other things which the world needs even more. Yet we owe it to him that we have thought of this plan, Chris returned. It would have been a plan of small value if left to him alone grandfather answered his thoughts seemed to be wandering idly for when he went on it was to speak of an entirely different matter once in my voyaging i fell in with a man a mr barton howland a passenger with whom i used to have some talk in the warm evenings under the stars he told me that he lived on the mississippi in a great house i gathered and with a host of serving men he talked to of his beautiful wife i am wondering whether the way you are going will lead past his door i should like to believe that you will see him Chris replied somewhat absently, for his own mind was upon a single question. How much longer will the winter hold? In spite of the excited watchfulness of all of them, it was Grandfather who first discovered that the chill waters of the stream had finally crept over the ice and reached up to embrace the pile of walnut logs. In wild haste, Chris and Knudsen made ready, gathering their tools, their bundles of provisions, and the little store of money which Grandfather had astonishingly produced from what Chris called his squirrel hole in the rafters of his cabin. It was Grandfather who, at the risk of an icy ducking, pushed the first log loose and watched it go whirling away in the tumbling current. Chris, setting out after it along the rocky riverbank, turned back for one last look at, at old Alexis Dahlberg. He seemed, as he had on the day that he cut the first tree, to have got back all his youth and strength and fire as he stood there at the edge of the rushing water, watching with intent eyes while the huge walnut log turned slowly about in midstream and then slid steadily away upon its long journey toward the sea.
Goodbye, the old man called in a voice as gay and young as was his face at that moment. It was not possible to tell whether the farewell was for his grandson or for his little nut tree.